Hello, everybody. I'm Erica Lukes, and I'm just happy to be here tonight because I have got the best news for you. Not only is it my birthday, which I couldn't think of a better place to spend my uh, 55th birthday. Yes, I just said that publicly. I feel like I'm um, coming out. I'm having a coming out party on my age. Yes, genetics. I'm very grateful <laughs> for genetics. But anyway, so you're celebrating my birthday with me. I also want to celebrate the incredible news that we got from our hard work of over a year we've been working on behalf of Expanding Frontiers to do records requests with Uwena County about Phenomicon, which is a conference that hosts uh, legendary paranormal people in the Bigfoot realm, in the realm of, uh, you know, conspiracies and, and factual information is definitely lacking at a conference that is paid for by uh, taxpayer funding. And so we have worked very hard. Jack has been just amazing with regard to the amount of work he's put into this, um, doing records requests, getting responses, responding to responses, and then um, it eventually culminated in the hearing with the State Records Committee on Thursday. And this was a huge win. After uh, arguments presented by the Uinta County uh, attorney, what we had happen was uh, the, the Senate Records Committee went behind the scenes, did a, a review of the documents that were redacted uh, by Uinta County, and in a unanimous vote, they all agreed that these documents should be made available to the public. And so this is a huge win for transparency. This is a huge win uh, for expanding frontiers. And so I just want to say congratulations, Jack, for all of your wonderful work. I want to thank all the people that support expanding frontiers. You can also support our ongoing work, efforts for transparency and in all the information that we're trying to put out, the historical archiving, um, it's really wonderful. You can go to our Patreon page. First, go to expandingfrontiersresearch.org to check it out. Check out our latest blog about the way everything rolled out. And then also um, do, do some deep dives on our blog. Do some deep dives on the archive that we put forward to the public, thanks to the help of people like Barry Greenwood, who is my guest tonight. And again, I am, I'm excited to, uh, like I'm, I'm mentioning, like spend my night with Mario, with Barry Greenwood, with all of you out there. Barry, welcome to the show. Hey, hello. How are you doing? I'm good. And I'm, I'm really shocked that you mentioned your age. You told me you weren't going to mention it. You know what? I did tell you that if you mentioned it, I might have to have a little moment. But you know what? I just figured, I don't know. Why not? It's, it is it is what it is. And, you yeah. know, I think I'm wearing 55 pretty, pretty well. So... <laughs> Well, the reason it was kind of stunning was because when you said you weren't going to mention it, I, I was going to bring up the fact that someone told me you knew President William McKinley personally, <laughs> and whether that was true or not. <laughs> so, yeah, it doesn't matter now. Yeah, it's uh, it's true. It's the cat's out of the bag, and so um, yes, I feel. I feel um, actually really great about the next year. Um, it's been an interesting journey over the past five years specifically, but having Expanding Frontiers, knowing people like yourself and interacting with people that I see here in chat, you know, it's just a great feeling to have a sense of community and to have a sense of um, people wanting the right information to be brought forth. Um, and I want to just, you know, give a little shout out. Um, hey, Sheldon and Jack, uh, Vancouver guy, Strange Recon, Amy, Jim, Peter, um, Arlene, thanks you guys for all being here. And Steve, thank you so much for your support. Ivy Bells, um, Phil, hello, my favorite troublemaker, Bill Pullen. Thank you guys so much just for all of your support. Again, um, it, it really like sometimes, as you know, Barry, doing what we do can be very isolating. It's kind of a lonely process, especially when you see the antics going on in the UFO, in the public you know, sphere, that can be even more off-putting. And so I think it's really great to have people that are asking critical questions and that want to preserve the history and want to look at facts. This is much needed 
especially in the, you know, like I said, in the world of what we've got going on with the uh, three ring circus with Knapp and Grush and Elizondo and, and all of that nonsense. Yeah, oh, this is a subject that's been devastated by conspiracies and controversies and and bad information and and a lot of us that have been in the subject for a long time are tired of it. Uh, so much so that we really don't want to deal with current events. We just rather dive back into the past and <clears throat> take what was there and and refine our understanding of it. Uh, because so much has been garbled over the years with, with data that, that people repeat and then re-repeat it. And, and you know how you, what happens when people tell stories to one another and you go down a line and the story changes as it goes along. There right, even if it's the same person that's been <laughs> saying the same story, you know, it's like, wow, this yeah. guy actually came up with this story. And then 20 years later, it's completely different than when he first told it. Right. So, you know, we're doing that with paper. Uh, what's been written, the same thing has happened. You take what was printed and it's changed down the line. So I, I, I want to go back and check the old information, the original sources, and, and see what that said and get back to where the, the information came from in the first place. That's very important to do now. Because I'm, I'm shocked sometimes the stories I remember when I see uh, the original sources, I, I, I'm stunned that it's so different from the later retellings of it. Sometimes it's it's better, it's it's more interesting, and but sometimes it's not so interesting. And that happens a lot. So it, you know, it's, it's it's something I like to do and. You only have 24 hours in a day to do things, and you, you can't do it all. So you just pick a pick your target and work on it. Right. And I think, you know, it, it's, it is probably nice in a lot of, you know, ways to just focus on what you're focusing on because there is so much uh, going on in, in the UFO circus, especially right now. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this because I think right now we're really seeing an escalation of um, propaganda of really uh, d dangerous rhetoric that are, you know, are spreading through online uh, UFO conspiracy forums. You know, you look at what uh, Jeremy Corbell is putting out and is weaponized. And then you look at Ross Colthart and dragging people behind Humvees. You look at this other type of uh, uh, rhetoric that is really unneeded. The threats to, I think, uh, people in the UFO subject have been very real. And I think that's unfortunate. It's a great discredit to uh, the history of the topic and the work that you've put into this and your colleagues over the years and decades. And so I think that it is really important right now that we speak out about this and all of us do this collectively. It's not just me, it's all of us doing this and calling people out. And I also wanna just say that now we're, we're getting ready, you know, we're in uh, getting ready for elections. Things are going to heat up in a big way and nowhere is that greater, you know, to see than on UFO Twitter and in UFO communities on social media. So that really you guys need to make sure, and I know everybody in chat that I'm seeing absolutely knows how to vet information, but people need to be, take this on, on their own and to, you know, really learn about verifying sources to make sure that we're not seeing a website that is, is put up and there are, you know, there's nobody behind the website, but yet they want you to go in and enter in all of your data like UAP caucus. Um, I'm going to throw that name out there. If any of you have any information about really at the end of the day, who was behind that organization, I would be much appreciative of that and would like to see that in chat, but we are living in a time very, as you know, not only uh, for, you know, our, our, the sake of our country, our democracy, but there's also a lot of instability in the world right now. And unfortunately, in my opinion, what we're seeing in the UFO community are the effects of a lot of foreign influence campaigns. And I actually spent the day, which is, this shows you how committed I am to this subject, but I listened to uh, Senate hearing 115-397, which is an open hearing on foreign influence operations and use of social media platforms. And there was third party uh, expert witness. This is a, a five hour uh, you know, event that I, I watched, but it is incredibly important. And I think all of you, you know, maybe spend an evening 
watching that and informing yourself about the way social media influence campaigns work. And one more thing before I let you talk, uh, Barry, it is it was very interesting to, to have them mention repeatedly that there are people that are solicited online by uh, the Russian government, uh, by the IRA, and they are journalists. Uh, some of them are people that want to pretend they're journalists, I'm sure, but they're um, trying to find work. And so they're being targeted and told that they will, they are given money to actually write stories to then put on websites that are, you know, I mean, coming out of nowhere just to try to get the content up and running. But then, you know, you see this kind of spread out. And then because you see so many examples of this being, you know, oh my gosh, we're seeing this here and here, the information spread out and that in the public's mind makes it more uh, of a something that's truthful and it's simply not. So I think it's really critical for people to understand what's going on in that regard and to know that this full well uh, is taking place in uh, ufology. So what are your thoughts on that, Barry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, over the years, I've noticed a trend uh, building up that uh, uh, people became more and more polarized in the subject. There was always polarization. You know, but one hand you had true believers, and the other hand you had extreme skeptics, and uh, they didn't really get along that well with each other. But uh, you know, it was always a, a large middle group that served as a buffer between the two. I have no problem with people thinking middle of the road. That seems to be a bad thing now. They're taking a middle position because each tribe on the extremes gets angry with you if you endure something the other side says. And uh, it, it doesn't have to be a wholesale acceptance. Uh, you, you just choose a middle path and try to um, make the best out of both sides, Get take the best ideas and, and blend them together. And that's how, the to me, the country had gotten along fairly well over the years. But it, it doesn't seem to be going that way anymore. There's, there's too much extremism, and, uh, and the, the UFO community is a microcosm of uh, society as a whole, where you, you do see the trends that have happened in the past, building up through time, happening within the, the, the UFO community. Uh, you mentioned a few examples of uh, uh, rhetoric and, and uh, positions that people are taking that they're almost militarized, uh, weaponized podcasts. Uh, I heard that Ross Colthart had uh, suggested stoning people. Uh, now, really, uh, that that's a bit too much. I, I understand the zeal that people can have with, with uh, in trying to push an idea and uh, resistance to that can make people angry, but uh, it, it's going too far. I mean, the the rhetoric alone is is disturbing. And I just read today in in a, a Twitter posting that the uh, the now former head of Arrow, uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick, uh, said that uh, he had his home broken into. I mean, why? What's what's the purpose of that? If someone's so angry, that they want to do something. They they think there's a, a disclosure there that that uh, they want to break in and steal it and all that. That's absolutely uncalled for. But uh, it, it, the rhetoric is there, and it's pushing some people in that direction. Well, people are being radicalized. You know, this is a cult. Yeah, it, it's, Let's it's, just get that straight. And people tribalism. are being radicalized. And you know, when I hear about what you know, Lou Elizondo has done behind the scenes. You know, and um, he, he, you know, I mean, obviously approaching, you know, from what I have heard, this is, this is my opinion. I'm just stating what I've heard. And this is, uh, you know, so take that with a grain of salt, but I'm sure some of you have also heard this, but, you know, his attempts to create a community, um, kind of target people who are former military, um, members, you know, much like you would see, some of with some of the, the proud boys and and the oath keepers and that kind of thing targeting uh, military ex-military and that really is is unfortunate um to see and it's it's dangerous and you know like to i just think that in time there will be more information that comes out on some of these subversive uh, groups of people with regard to that this is really dangerous and as you mentioned having you know kirkpatrick um 
say that his home was broken into. He's obviously mentioned the threats before. Other people have as well, you know, in in regard to this. And that's just, it's it's dangerous. It doesn't need to happen. People need to wake up, grow up, and uh, look around and pay attention and do the right thing. Uh, I used to laugh at the idea when it was said in the past that, that UFOs were becoming a religion that uh, they were true believers and, and they, they, they bow to the altar of ufology. And it, it seemed ridiculous to me, but I, I wouldn't say it's so ridiculous now. There seems to be that sort of extremism creeping in to the point where uh, the, the desire to believe in a particular exotic explanation for the phenomenon is, is so much that they'd be willing to uh, uh, commit violence or, or, or verbally abuse someone to the point of almost breaking the law. And uh, uh, Kirkpatrick, you know, his home was broken into and, and death threats on top of it. Why does he have to have death threats thrown in his direction for sitting as a chair of a, an organization issuing a report uh, questioning uh, some of the old mantras in the subject. It, the, the subject's not proven. It, as much as you like to think there's a, there's a wild answer out there to it, none of it's been proven. That's correct. We haven't been able to prove any of this. And uh, uh, I think the Arrow report recently included uh, crash disks, and, and uh, they also stressed the fact that uh, people do make mistakes in, in observations that the sightings they report can be explained ultimately. There's nothing wrong with that. We've known that for, for decades, but it, it's almost like it's being rediscovered and it's a terrible thing to do. And, and uh, people have to pull themselves back and, and, and get to a middle ground again and, and deal with the phenomenon seriously stop going overboard, stop treating it like it, it's uh, uh, an article of faith that you have to push it all as being uh, attributed to some sort of a, a unusual answer, whether time travelers or parallel dimensions or extraterrestrials, which is the most popular. Um, there's, there's no need to have to push any of that right now. We don't have those answers yet. People are looking for proof. They're looking for disclosure. Okay, well, what's disclosure? To me, it's disclosing things that have been kept secret for years and years. And I've been doing that since the 70s uh, through FOIA and, and through uh, historical research. There's a lot of things we haven't seen for a very long time. And they're, they're interesting, surprising, but not proof. It's just not proof. So let's get back to normal. Right. And, and I think that it would be really healthy for everyone to step away from, you know, UFO Twitter. I've said that many, many times. I mean, who knows wh where that came from, who's behind the strings, but you can clearly see when you go to UFO Twitter, it is definitely full of divisiveness. I mean, it's just all about, you know, creating this, this angst, which is very clearly um, by design, in my opinion, it should be by most normal people's thinking by design as well. It's also, an attempt to to mine data to see how people tick. Again, you know, as we've seen over the years with Facebook and social media platforms, how what a wonderful way it is to to mine data for people with specific goals. You know, and this is with the amount of uh, with with as far as UAP advocates have gotten. You know, we, <laughs> right now I think we need to kind of step back and say, whoa, this is, uh, what, what is this about? Is this really about UAP disclosure or is this about playing political games on behalf of a foreign adversary, which would right. be my, my, my guess. <clears throat> I think everyone, uh, when they first become involved in the subject, they have very strong viewpoints about it. The, the, it's enthusiasm that grabs them and they want to, uh, push the, the, the strangeness aspect of the subject as much as possible. Uh, but over time, again, you, you, as you look into things, they tend to mitigate and, and uh, sometimes aren't so unusual. Some, some are, and they're interesting, but again, they're interesting to a point. Uh, 
uh, beyond which you can't really do much. Uh, you know, it, I, I've always compared the subject uh, to a puzzle, just a puzzle. And someone throws you a few pieces and wants to know what it shows. And I, I think, well, I can't explain that because I don't have all the pieces. You have a 500 piece puzzle, you have 300 pieces, where's the rest? You have to go dig them out if you can and if they're available. And until you can complete all the pieces, you, you can't explain what the picture is. We're, we're at that point now. We've been at that point now for like, over 75 years. You just don't have enough to go by. I, I never wanted to kill Donald Menzel or Phil Class because they had contrary views to my thinking there was something to the subject. Right. That's a great point. <laughs> so, you know, why why should people do that now? And yeah, then you know, recently we, we've had the, uh, the, the hour report released, which Kirkpatrick uh, oversaw uh, about a week and a half ago. <clears throat> And it was an interesting document. Uh, as I said, in, in general principle, I agree with it, but there was a problem with that too. And, and with, with Kirkpatrick's uh, presentation in that the uh, report described itself as a, a historical study. It was described as uh, analytical and uh, rigorous uh, what science should be scientific in fact was used but the problem is when i sat down to read the report i, I noticed right from the get-go that uh, there were issues with with uh, that were evident in the table of contents simple table of contents it, it's just a brief description of what's inside yet uh, there were glaring problems there and uh i was bothered by the fact that it, it called itself a rigorous historical document because the errors were rather flagrant. Uh, uh, one of them involved uh, uh, chrono chronological dating of UFO programs. Uh, they claimed that UFO investigations started in 1945. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, 45? What happened in 1945? I was, I was rather puzzled. The only thing I knew about <clears throat> was uh, the uh, Foo Fighter phenomenon, which had it just broken into the news uh, on January 2nd of that year. But it was very brief, very censored. Uh, it disappeared quickly. And nothing much more was said about it from then on and, until uh, the flying saucer craze uh, occurred in, in 1947. So what happened with 1945? Where did they get that information? They don't say. There's nothing particular in the document that says government investigated UFOs at that time. Uh, they did mention uh, Project Saucer, which was a nickname. It wasn't necessarily official. It was, it was basically Project Sign. But someone at Arrow, uh, read a few UFO books and took that as the final word. And one of the books they read was uh, Edward Ruppelt's uh, report on unidentified flying objects, which is a great book, uh, but it's not flawless. There are mistakes in it. Uh, but they mentioned that, and they mentioned the fact that in the book, uh, Ruppelt had spoken to a person at Project Sign, which was somewhat before his tenure with Project Blue Book. And uh, he mentioned that uh, there were investigations going on a year before 1947, and it was called Project Saucer. And Ruppelt took that, it, it just one sentence, and put it in the book and left it. Someone rediscovered it, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, Project Saucer, 
how could there be a project saucer prior to 47 when the flying saucer phenomenon wasn't even named that until 1947? It, 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 it was a, an, an anachronism. It was out of place. His source couldn't possibly have called it Project Saucer a year before 1947, certainly not 1945. So <clears throat> it is a head scratcher with that one. I, I, I couldn't understand it. I, I later found uh, that maybe Jacques Vallée was responsible because he was pushing Trinity and he had government connections and uh, it's just uh, something that they, they put in there as a favor uh, uh, to Valet. But if they're ex accepting information that's based on very dubious sourcing, and it doesn't say much about it, that being a historical report. That's a problem. So there, there were other things too. I, I, I had a, I had a list of them. Uh, uh, let's see if I can find a few of them. Oh, Project Bear, another one. Again, table of contents. Project Bear is mentioned. So people, a lot of people would go, "What's Project Bear?" Um, again, Ruppelt, uh discussed. The, uh, uh, the activities of Battelle Memorial Institute and how they were given a, a task of uh, assessing Soviet technological developments and all. And uh, as a result of that, uh, UFOs crept into it. I mean, yeah, it's a national security issue, flying objects over military bases and all. So th that it was reasonable that that be included in uh, what Patel was doing. And officially it was called Project Stork or White Stork as it became later known. But um, Ruppelt in, in making his, his uh, reminiscences public about Project Blue Book uh, had to rename it. He, he, it was still uh, classified information. So he calls it Project Bear as a nickname. There was no official Project Bear. So that's in his book. And I see that Arrow repeats the nickname as an official name. Now in the text of the uh, the report, they explain, well, yeah, it was Rupel called it Project Bear, but they never said it was called Project Stork or White Stork, which was the official uh, notation on it. Why couldn't they do that? Why didn't they know that Project Stork was the real name? They went by Ruppelt's superficial discussion of it without checking to see what that was beyond just Ruppelt. It was an acceptance of a few sources and that's all that needed to be done. Maybe they were in a rush or, or maybe they didn't know about other sourcing that, that had information about that, but it was very, very... Uh, very, very one-offish. They they didn't dwell, del, <coughs> excuse me, uh, delve into UFO history uh, very deeply. So uh, that was a problem. And then, then there were lots of other problems. They they had, uh, which is kind of funny, Kenneth Arnold sighting uh, <laughs> happening on June twenty third, nineteen forty seven. Hmm. Well, uh, yeah, that Arnold sighting happened on June 24th. I, I think anyone who's been in the subject for even a short amount of time could repeat that in their sleep. Well, but Arrow, no, no. <laughs> Arrow couldn't. I mean, Arrow, it, it, it was it a typo? No, well, you know, again, why are typos getting into a rigorous historical report? It, it's uh, it, it's very strange. They had the Battelle Institute, the, the Project Stork thing, and and the um, uh, the document that came out of that uh, Blue Book Special Report 14, uh, being released in late 1954. Uh, well, the document was dated May 5th, 1955. 
had nothing to do with 54. 55 was the hard release, and, and it was uh, discussed in the newspapers later on. So little odd things. Uh, National Security Council, uh, they had an intelligent advisory committee during the 50s. Uh, Arrow attributes it to uh, the CIA. CIA didn't have that. There was National Security Council. Condon Committee, that was uh, given as, as beginning in April 1968. Uh, the University of Colorado was given the contract for that in 1966, and investigations proceeded from that point on. I, I remember collecting news clippings about Condon investigations through 1967. Why is April 1968 mentioned as, as the date of the Condon report? So can I ask you, have you reached out to anybody to try to, to get this information corrected? Well, it would have to be done through the government, and peop, uh, this has been brought up. I mean, it's only been a week and a half, so you know there are plans to try to find someone who uh, can have influence on this. But the report's out. It's too late for that one. They're, they're planning a volume two, which is, uh, I, I, I think, a deeper dive into the so-called uh, anonymous witnesses that they had. But uh, whether they're going to make corrections uh, to the first report in the second one, I, I, I don't know. So what did they get right? Um, they, uh, they quoted history on Project Mercury, Project Gemini, a, a lot of uh, uh, programs that were once classified in the past, uh, uh, basic history. Um, it, it, it was a, a, an assessment of the technological developments over the years uh, that, that may have been related directly or peripherally to uh, UAP investigations, but it was just basic history. They got that right because everybody knows it. I would have been shocked if they, they didn't have the facts of Project Apollo wrong. But that, that was correct. Um, but it, it's it's the mistakes that, that are the issue. Uh, it, it makes you doubt the, the integrity of a report when you see so many mistakes like that. Well, I have to say that I was quite excited about a few things that were in the report with regard to, you know, obviously shining a spotlight on a crew of unreliable uh, narrators in the topic, which I think is, you know, probably one of the main missions, uh, mm. hopefully, due to the, the um, vitriol and the hate rhetoric uh, coming out of, you know, on, on behalf of this group. So um, I think that's always a good, good thing, a good move. Um, but, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it, it pointed out uh, that, that uh, uncritical belief is not a good thing and and people should be cautious about their data, but they're telling you to be cautious while they're not being cautious at the same time. It, it's, it's, it's weird, but hopefully some of this will be fixed uh, in the future so that it won't happen again. I, I, yeah, I, I, you know, I told a few people when it surfaced, it, uh, they were angry with me for uh, criticizing Arrow and, and Kirkpatrick on these issues. Well, he's going to make a mistake here and there. And they said, well, what if I wrote a, a his, historical article or a book saying that Maunet uh, was in Antarctica or that the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1712? What would you think of my work, my research? You would question my ability to write something like that with any authority. This is not just simply typo information that's being out of whack. It, it, it's the interpretation of basic past, basic history. It's being garbled and, and uh, jumbled by uh, Arrow, and people should worry about that. Because in the future, they're going to issue more reports and uh, if, if they're not up on the history of the subject by that time, there's a real problem with uh, taking them seriously. I, I uh, 
I remember back in 2021, the, the uh, predecessor to Arrow, the UAP task force, uh, wrote a report. Yes. And it, it had some pretty extraordinary conclusions, I thought, uh, that uh, they, they really mystified the subject thoroughly. And, and one of the, the big things was that uh, they claimed uh, out of 144 reports that were studied, 143 were unexplained. That would be a figure of something like 99, 99.3% of the total number of reports is being unidentified. Well, the Air Force, through all of Project Blue Book, um, had a very small percentage, single digit percentage of unknowns out of 12,000 reports, 701 were unidentified. Uh, the Condon report, their percentage was a little higher, oddly enough, uh, in, in their case study, something like 30%, but it was still a fairly low figure. Why Why the task force report would issue at 99.3% at, uh, is, is just incredible. I, and I was astonished by it at first, until later, it, it became evident that uh, the task force was dominated by people who were well known to be connected to Skinwalker Ranch. A reliable group, that that group right there. Uh, Travis Taylor was the chief scientist. James Lekatsky was his boss. Uh, and Lekatsky was high up in government. He was the one that, was, that, that had really kick-started uh, a lot of what's going on with the new government uh, interest now. <clears throat> but it was, it was uh, based on a, a very strange uh, source. Uh, Skinwalker Ranch uh, has, has issues and problems. I mean, the way they interpret data, the, the, the weird stories that have come out of there, the, the famous dino beavers and wow. the Alifrogs. Wow, it was one of the security guards that was naked or something. Well, give me a break. The, the shadow people, uh, giant owls. A lot of really bizarre stuff was coming out there, and the people that that were involved in these stories seemed to be making conclusions about the uh, UAP task force. And it would make sense that they, they would come to those very high unexplained figures because that would tend to to juice the, uh, the funding requests and, and get Skinwalker Ranch probably more attention because uh, it's being connected to this very strange, mysterious phenomenon. Right. Yeah. Well, and, which we all know is a load. But you had, mar you had markers in the government kind of shilling for Skinwalker Ranch, among other things. And that uh, that was dishonest. I was very upset when I discovered that that was the case. I, I had written a very praising piece on the original task force release, but after it came out, uh, I was invited to do a, a book review by uh, the Society for Scientific Exploration. And they, they told me to do something on the uh, the second Skinwalker book, uh, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. And I utterly retracted the original endorsement of the Task Force report in that article because I felt I had been had. And everybody was had in, as a result. It's, it's terrible what happened. But the uh, later on, as, as the uh, government releases evolved, the, the percentages came way down into the single digits once again, which is, I think, what most of the UFO community would say was probably accurate. Even ardent believers would, would say, yeah, well, 90% of the reports can be explained. That That's okay, that's common sense. There's only a small percentage of unknowns that, that people should be concerned about. And uh, that's where we're at now. The government's come back to, come back to the earth, but that's removed from influences uh, from outside influences like uh, Skinwalker Ranch. Well, and it's interesting, you know, what all this took place during a certain administration, but, you know, that's okay. Um, I won't mention that. Um, but, you know, it is, I think it is really great 
that you know you I loved the review that you wrote for SSE. I thought that was really important. Um, I think it's really wonderful to also see this kind of groundswell where people are calling Skinwalker Ranch out. In my opinion, it is the biggest grift in the history of the subject and you know perpetrated by uh, Robert Bigelow and his shady uh, cast of characters and then carried on by Brandon Fugel and his team of unreliable narrator narrators. I, um, and to me, it is really um, interesting as I study this and, and, you know, we're doing reports at EFR specifically about the latest thing that I mentioned with Phenomicon and the, the grifting off of, of this topic associated with it. And it, it's really interesting as well to see that people are um, getting hurt. People are taking what they're saying seriously, and it's not uh, it's not okay. Um, it would be one thing if these people actually had the integrity to say, you know, we're we're learning, we're exploring data, we can't verify things are true, but they're doubling down on their uh, nonsense, and it does affect people. And it's it's not, in my opinion, when we've got Governor Cox uh, of Utah popping off about the safety of children and signing legislation to protect people from social media and all of these things. He ought to be doing the same about somebody that was on his economic advisory board and the COVID advisory board uh, about them promoting information that has a potentially dangerous effect on people who have uh, mental uh, instability, you know, issues. I think that that's uh, Governor Cox ought to look in the mirror on that. That's my, there's my little rant for a moment, but. Uh, well, uh, you know, you, you've gotten a release of documents related to Phenomicon and all that. It, it, it's that's interesting because this is saying essentially, and I'm far removed from this the other side of the country, but the the the, the state of Utah was funding uh, money for this Phenomicon. Uh, yeah. Sponsored by the Utah Travel and Tourism Board. Okay, so the, do they expect that there's travel and tourism going to Skinwalker Ranch? You know what, they, their, their explanation is, of course, none of this has been verified. They don't have the receipts to prove it, either that or they're not sharing. Uh, but, you know, they're they're saying that this increases tourism in the area, which to, in my opinion, is is they're not verifying that again. Those should be facts and figures that should be re readily available to the public, but they're not. And they're claiming that it's it's a boost for hotels and for restaurants and different things. And, you know, basically what you have are people going to an event that is held. They're a captive audience. Um, they're in an event center for the whole time. Food trucks owned and operated by family, friends, and members of, you know, that, that Skinwalker Ranch community are waiting outside. They're profiting from the food. People aren't going into the community to shop or things, but they're staying at a big uh, chain motel in in the Uinta Basin. And, and to make matters worse, when I was doing digging, a lot of digging into this and talking to people at different uh hotels and places where they would expect an increase in tourism as they're alleging. Basically what I was told is this is a really peak time for tourism in the area due to the wonderful uh, sites, Dinosaur Land, some of the other uh, McCoy Flats, some of the other beautiful places in that area. And so that is always a time that is, is really big with tourism. So for them to go ahead and claim these without again giving facts and information, much like Skinwalker Ranch is just, you know, well, pretty much par they, for the course. They, they want tourism for, for uh, uh, dinosaur sites and, and other attractions around there. Why don't they fund those attractions right. instead right. of sending it to Skinwalker Ranch promotion? You know, that is a question that we've asked. You know, we asked that. Um, I, I mentioned that on, on Fox News, you know, Fox 13 News, who, who covered the story as well. Uh, Nate Carlisle did a good job with that. I appreciate that. Um, and it, it is, you know, why aren't we promoting things that are, you know, this is our history. This is our heritage. These are things that aren't hurting people and promoting, you know, absolutely false information. Um, but you know, that's because there are a handful of people up there that have a vested interest in making money. Um, they're going to continue this kind of 
grift at the expense of other people in the community. Like why, why aren't we putting money in that community? Why are we raising taxes by, by 6% um, in, in that community? Why, why aren't we funding things that need to be funded? Why are people, you know, homeless? Why are people, um, you know, uh, you know, the, what is happening with domestic violence? You know, what's, what are all these things in the community? How are they, how are they supporting the community? Well, they're not, they're making a lot of money. You know, if you want to pay 2000 bucks to watch Travis Taylor eat a ham sandwich, then, you know, seriously, let's, let's get a clue, get a life and, you know, get out of mama's basement. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I mean, it, it just, it just seems uh, that the government's newfound interest in the subject since 2017 had a birthplace at Skinwalker Ranch, although there were the other incidents involving Navy pilots, which happened separately. Uh, they weren't part of that, but uh, I, I think any year you, that goes by, you could probably find UFO witnesses, uh, especially in the military, having uh, peculiar encounters. It just happened that the publicity for, for that Skinwalker originated new newfound uh, curiosity about the subject. Uh, swept in the the pilot stories is is uh, a way to enhance the the main purpose was which was to get funding for things like Skinwalker and other paranormal things. Is, is, isn't it true that uh, Skinwalker is known as the paranormal Disneyland? Gag. Yes, unfortunately. That's a name they gave themselves. I I believe <laughs> because they're thinking outside the box. There. I mean, Dang, that, I don't know who does their marketing, but clearly, I mean. Uh, I mean Disneyland's an amusement park, so the implication is there. You know, you come out here, you might see uh, strange things. It, it, it's a, a false promise, though. You, you know what was really interesting in our hearing, um, which you can find, I'll post the link later in the show, uh, on the State Records Committee website. You can go in and listen to that hearing in full, and that really is uh, important for people who want to use grandma, who want to use FOIA, uh, for records requests uh, from the government. This is, you know, it's, it's really fascinating. And, and in the hearing, the attorney for, uh, for Verna was, was kind of comparing the contracts and wanting them to remain secret as, as kind of comparing them to a magician and mm. wanting to make sure that his proprietary mm. information was kept a secret. And I, I found that he's done that. He's, that's, you know, that's, that's an, a very interesting comparison for, for the attorney uh, to make. And so uh, what does that say? Uh, I think at the end of the day though, it, it you know, we do, things are coming to, to light. I also wanna say that Senator Ronald Winterton, who uh, is Tom Winterton's father, is also written uh, legislation that just uh, passed for the movie industry, the motion picture industry, and then also, for uh, the Skinwalker legislation, which means that you can't go uh, to that area and use ground penetrating LIDAR or any other, you can't use any, uh, take any photographs or uh, inter interrupt or intercept any communications between uh, anybody uh, on that area. And if you can, it's a felony charge. So just go look at, do a little uh, search for Senator Tom, Ronald Winterton, excuse me, and look at some of the things he's doing. And then also, I just want to say that in that area, there is obviously it's, it's a rich resource for the oil and gas industry. And they're working on the Uinta Basin Railway, which thank goodness has not passed uh, so far due to many environmental concerns. But, you know, who is involved in, in that that is involved in uh, the Skinwalker Ranch crew and community and what benefits could they potentially have as a result of some of these things which are uh, going to be detrimental to our environment. So there's so many layers to all of this. And I, I want to go while I'm on my little rant here, um, mm -hmm. Emily, <laughs> thank you for uh, saying that. I love you. It's good to see you. I can't wait to be on your show next week. Um, but to, you know, for people to assume that it's about one UFO case or it's about one specific thing, you have to look at the bigger picture. You have to look at who's promoting the narrative, what their network is, what motivations they have, you know, what the history is. You know, there's, as you know, 
you know, history is a puzzle. You mentioned you have to get all of the pieces and put them together before you have a clear understanding of what is going on. And I think we have done that very uh, thoroughly here with Skinwalker Ranch. I'm very proud of that between all of us, Barry, uh, Jack, uh, and and myself, and all the people in chat who have also been doing wonderful work on on looking into things as well. So thank you, all of you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we have to uh, apply some standards and this is not a healthy thing for research overall when you take uh, bits of information and, and, and embellish and puff them up beyond the ability to uh, bear the weight of evidence. And when you do that, you're, you're, it's false advertising. And it's got to stop right? where the state government of Utah should uh, help to promote uh, some really dubious narratives is beyond me. Right. And I think it's also, and thank you for mentioning that, it is also interesting to see the Attorney General Sean Reyes, who's been embroiled in controversy after controversy uh, and is in quite a bit of uh, trouble at the moment. Uh, you see him promoting uh, Skinwalker Ranch being on panels at at the you know local conference or whatever the conference was uh, that they were doing. Um, you can find that on on YouTube to see Skinwalker panel with Sean Reyes and then also Governor former Governor Gary Gary Herbert who appeared on the show. And you know you just kind of think, really, is this what our public? Is this what our public officials are doing? You know, right. it's, it's it's pretty laughable. It's pretty sad. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, uh, uh, one other thing I wanted to mention uh, about the Arrow report, and then yes. we can wrap it up for now. Um, they they devoted, I think, uh, probably the, the single most number of references to uh, an article that appeared in 1997. Uh, by a uh, CIA uh, historian, Gerald Haynes. And uh, it made news at the time. Uh, in 1997, you had uh, the, the uh, Heaven's Gate uh, suicides, and uh, it happened to be the same year as the 50th anniversary for Roswell. So uh, I had anticipated uh, there was gonna be a lot of publicity on the subject, so I had subscribed to a clipping service uh, and it, it just happened to start when Heaven's Gate occurred. And I was, I was blasted with clippings for a while on that one. But it, it was really intended to see what was being said about Roswell and the anniversary and and uh, whether the government was going to react to it or not. They, they had to some extent uh, around 1995 uh, with a search for information on Roswell, which turned up, I don't think, much of anything. But... Uh, the whole year was was Roswell year, and uh, people had a fun time. They went out to the festival, enjoyed themselves, and and uh, a lot of folks who had promoted Roswell as a legitimate flying saucer crash had uh, uh, gained a lot of publicity about it. But at the same time, uh, government was taking advantage of it too, and and they, the CIA decided to uh, help promote this article that uh, made a rather remarkable claim, I thought, at the time. And it's what most of the headlines focused upon when this was released. The article was called CIA's Role in the Study of UFOs, 1947 to 1990. And it was intended to be sort of a sweeping history of, of the subject from the CIA's point of view. But the thing they focused upon uh, <laughs> I, I just, uh, my jaw dropped when I saw it. They made a claim that uh, of, of all the Project Blue Book reports, more than half of them were attributed to uh, U-2 spy plane and, and so-called ox cart flights that the government had conducted uh, secretly uh, for monitoring uh, the then Soviet Union and, and other matters. And I, I mean, I knew something about Project Blue Book at the time uh, through the various histories and all. And to, that statement was, was, it seemed like uh, far out of the ballpark, more than half of all reports 
we were attributed to spy planes. I, I thought to myself, well, okay. Now the implication of that is that the uh, CIA has a secret file independent of Project Blue Book that concluded that this was the case. Because Project Blue Book, if you look at the case histories, um, it says no such thing. Summer aircraft, summer misidentifications. Uh, you don't get the impression at all that there's any spy plane uh, conclusions in any of those reports. There would have to be a massive database of separately investigated reports within the CIA that makes that case. Otherwise, that, that claim is meaningless. They must have data. So we inquired about it back then. Uh, nothing. We were trying to discover where that came from. And it seems that it all focused back into another book, which was a classified volume at the time, but uh, eventually we were able to get a, a FOIA release on it and, and have the whole book released. So we check it, and once again, it, there's no data. They, they don't have any uh, reference points for making that claim. So the, the, the book that the CIA quoted was, was as specious as the claims that were getting into the press at the time. There was no substantiation for it. And it, I mean, if, if anything could be more dishonest, uh, there you go. It was a way to blow off. I, I, I understood that the, the CIA book, there was a way to dismiss the subject quickly from their point of view. Just say it's, you know, it's, you two ox carts and that's it and and put an end to it it was repeated for the press in the 90s and it, it, it once again it disappeared no now arrow is quoting this now as legitimate and it it, it it's almost like a lazy man's way of doing history they're just going to, as I mentioned before, keep repeating the, the same bad information constantly. There was a big feature of this, uh, of this latest report. There were 17 references to the article to back up their inclusion of it in the, uh, in the document. It's nonsense. Some, you know, certainly some spy planes could have been responsible, but not, not, a, not a vast majority like that. It's crazy. You, and they couldn't prove it anyway. I think you're muted. I love it when I talk to myself. It's great. But at least I'm just practicing. And so when I unmute my mic, there you go. Um, but, I mean, do you, do you feel that the, you know, obviously the extraterrestrial hypothesis was floated around and you've got, you know everything that happened with Kehoe and NICAP and and all of that. But do you do you think that there was ever a point in time when the intelligence community said we need to to stop this because this could be potentially detrimental if we don't actually decide that we need to get facts on the table instead of promoting and stoking UFO uh, lore? Uh, I mean, the, the Arrow report is is really not a great deal different from. Um, all the reports in the past you have more different kinds of information data and all but uh the same basic push that you know there's nothing to it don't worry about it uh, uh, but is there something to it that remains to be seen i mean we have a lot we have an explained report so as i said i call them puzzles we haven't solved all the puzzles yet but it doesn't mean you attach a crazy explanation for why it's all happening it's this, this simply puzzles that once you give them a look, they remain unexplained and they go in the file like that. If the, if the information can be used to construct the theory, which is based on facts, not conjecture, otherwise it'd be uh, called hypotheses. If you can construct a, a valid theory on UFO reporting as being something unusual, then do so. Otherwise, unexplained, and that's as far as it goes. 
Yes. Um, but I mean, do you feel though that right now, especially given the uh, current political sentiment in our country with the distrust of the government and the, you know, yada, 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 all of this stuff that it really is now really the right time to be using the UFO topic to stoke distrust in the government and um, to create divisions in our community or other communities? Oh, you know, nefarious people are going to use any topic for their own purposes. And, and UFOs are a topic ripe with which to influence conspiracy theorists, people that are prone to belief and get them to think like you think by uh, first appealing to their interest in the topic and then perhaps slipping a, a political agenda in with that information. To get them think like you are, the, you know the, the some of the violent rhetoric that you're hearing about now that that certainly could come from uh, suspicious sources out there trying to stoke uh, distrust and and uh, get people to to think certain ways. Right. You know, and I, I want to just bring up this topic. I was talking with Jack about it a little bit earlier, and you and I have talked about this plenty over the years, but, you know, I want to talk a little bit about coast to coast and their um, willingness to promote conspiracy, not only conspiracy theories, but people who are really despicable human beings, Alex Jones, prime example, uh, you know, Roger Stone, people that were actively promoting, are actively promoting QAnon, you know, Michael Flynn, people like that. Um, I think that people, you know, the, the public doesn't hasn't taken the damage that coast to coast and the programming has, has really done and the way that it, it has spawned this whole group of, of people that are, I, I think, uh, potentially quite dangerous, you know, and, and there have been many studies about people being radicalized in ways like this and then going on to uh, commit atrocities. So I just, you know, I think that that's something people don't talk about. I mean, are we afraid of the repercussions of talking about, uh, you know, people that are promoting this? Well, yeah, coast to coast. I, you know, I, I'm probably one of the few people that would say I, I, I don't think I ever listened to a full broadcast of coast to coast, even even on recordings. I, I just, I, it was on the middle of the night and I worked days and I just couldn't listen to it. There are a lot of stories about it, but, um, you know, to, to uh, mention the negative effects that it could have on people, all you have to do is go back to uh, uh, Heaven's Gate once right. again. And what happened to them? It was uh, it was clearly linked uh, that suicides were linked to uh, information that Art Bell was discussing. Let's talk, let's talk a little bit more about that because I know that there are people listening that don't have, you know, an understanding and probably some, some of, some of you who are listening might not have even been born when Heaven's Gate happened, but let's talk a little bit about all of that and then talk about the influence that Art Bell, that the UFO conspiracy community had on uh, kind of uh, lighting the fire for that. Can you right, do that right, for yeah. us? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Bell would have all kinds of uh, people on with different claims. And I, I, one of the claims came from a, a, a photographer who uh, would take shots of the night sky and, and uh, UFOs would turn up now and then. And uh, one of the pictures he had showed a uh, strange image on it. Uh, and uh, they claimed that... Uh, it was a spacecraft of some kind and it was coming towards the earth. And at the time there was a, a comet that was going to be visible shortly in, in the skies as well. And, and it, it, the theories that were bandied about as to what this object was in the photograph, but uh, it was suggested that, well, it seemed to be coming in uh, behind the comet and uh, it was on some sort of a mission, and and uh, when the comet became visible, it was in the newspapers, quite popular. And uh, Heaven's Gate took the the information that was suggested on Bell's show as as a sign that the aliens are coming to pick them up. 
And the only way they were going to be picked up was to commit suicide. They dressed up in uh, nice new clothes and, and new shoes and new sneakers and, and packed their bags. Uh, took a, a solution of some kind and uh, they passed away in their beds with their suitcases beside them. They truly believed they were going to be taken away by aliens coming in behind uh, the comet. And uh, after it happened, obviously, uh, the show didn't want to take responsibility for it. I, I don't believe Bell took responsibility for that, but it was on his show where the, the, the nugget of information was put out there that caused them to do this. So, I mean, if you want a, a, a starker example of, of how a show like that can uh, uh create newsy events there it is that that's uh, that's remarkable what happened you influence i believe 39 people to kill themselves and it's not like they were they weren't suggestible before that they certainly were it was it was essentially a cult uh that the men castrated themselves how you do that is beyond me but that's what they did and that was part of being involved with the group and it is amazing. And I think it's so easy because the UFO topic is so easy to, to discount. You know, it's people don't take these things seriously. They don't take Ramtha, Jay-Z Knight, and, and you know, some of the, the interesting things that have gone on uh, with her and her cult members over the decades um, and the detrimental influence that that can have. I mean, people aren't taking this seriously. And I think it's way past the time to take this seriously. And although, you know, Art Bell can't be held personally, personally responsible for, you know, what he's, he's, you know, for, for their deaths, it certainly did, he and Courtney Brown, the remote viewer, you know, it certainly didn't help. Um, and I think that mm -hmm. at the end of the day, to my knowledge, Art Bell never any, you know, took any responsibility or, uh, maybe even floated the idea that he was sorry that that tragedy had occurred, which I thought was interesting. I know if that would have been myself and something like that would have happened, I yeah, I you know, think it was affected me, was, and I would have acknowledged yeah, it. <laughs> I think he was sorry about it, but at the same time, he he didn't feel like uh, he was in any way contributing to what had happened, and and uh, you know, one could argue with that. Just broadcasting. A, a dubious information as he did like that that led to the suicide there's some responsibility there don't put that stuff on if if it's a problem if it's going to be misinterpreted by someone that badly you can't do that they'd be a little more uh, uh, circumspect about what you talk about on the air with paranormal topics if it could cause uh, issues like that you just don't discuss it. Right. I, I think it is, it's um, right. I think it, there is a responsibility to people to put out factual information. And if it's not factual information, then by all means put a, you know, disclosure, a dis, you know, just say that we, you know, we're, this is what this is. This is, you could, this isn't fact. It hasn't been proven. Mm. Take it with a grain of salt. You know, I just think that that's, you know, I, unfortunately we don't, hold people um, to high standards in this topic, as right, we've seen right. by all of the really special people that have been on the speaking list for decades that had criminal records and, uh, you know, <laughs> so forth. Yeah, well, the, the field needs to clean itself up of, of elements like that. And it, it's, it doesn't seem to be any sign that there's too much of a desire to do that. But I, I, know it looks like that and i have to say that i you know i'm sure well I, I i do have hope i really do i i um you know i listen to uh you know emily louise and and some of these wonderful discussions and steve berg and uh tanner boyle i mean there's so many when steve long who's here in chat i mean some of, some of these people um are out here in the community and they are really trying to do good work to get information out and I love, I love what they're doing. And I think there is hope. And 
we also have to understand that we're going up against a huge machine that has a lot of money behind it. And they're promoting, you know, these stories and they can, can do their marketing in mass uh, on social media platforms. And, you know, that's, that's a lot for us to contend with, but we're doing it. And I'm very hopeful that we can make a change. I think, in my opinion, this is really the first time in the history of the topic where we are seeing this kind of uh, a mass movement to make sure that we're correcting course. And I, I'm very, very pleased and very hopeful about that. So, mm. yeah, well, within the subject, there are a lot of good people that are uh, responsible and, and want to promote accurate information. That, that's, uh, that goes without saying. Uh, but it, it seems like what becomes public are the, are the bad things. And that may be part of the desire by a news cycle to report exciting, controversial matters. Uh, people get all excited about uh, uh, sensationalism, I should say. Uh, uh, they, they enjoy it. it. It attracts attention. It gets viewers. It gets ratings on television. It always has and it always will, as long as something like television exists. Uh, but uh, it, it is just, uh, it, it's bothersome that that there's it, been problems so long that continue and that the same kinds of problems, just with different names and, and different people involved. But the, the same thing continues. It, you know, I think at, at one point, the, they were paranormal talk, topics disguised within uh, a meeting of the, uh, uh, the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and they, and they, they discussed uh, what to do about um, the increasing proliferation of uh, uh, paranormal topics, uh, things that aren't uh, mitigated by facts and information. And... Uh, uh, they didn't quite know what to do. You need the cooperation of media to do that, and a lot of media didn't want to do it. They, they would rather go in the other direction, just just to juice up their advertising dollars. So, you know, it's, it's science against media and government against media, and, and you have clashing elements here that uh, you know, seem to be working uh, against one another. Well, and I, I will say that it you know, the, the media does have a responsibility to do fact checking as well. And when they, you know, ran the New York times ran with that, you know, what we know now is the, you know, December <laughs> debacle. That's what I'm calling it. That's the story with Elizondo and Keen and, and the, you know, BS brokers, uh, you know, when that, you know, took flight and then because we're seeing it in the New York times, huh, you know, it's, you know, this is, is, you know, the written word is, you know, in stone and yada, yada, yada. I think it's, it's um, you know, that the, the media did have a responsibility. The New York Times had a responsibility to actually do some, you know, to look into this cast of characters promoting false narratives. But then also, you know, we saw that that ran on every news outlet from, you know, left to right to middle to whatever, all over the world. And the people that were airing those stories, obviously it was a lot of clickbait, you know, let's just get some, some quick views, but it's like, come on now, let's, let's do a little um, digging. And so that, that is on the media, the mainstream mm. media. Yeah. That, do yeah fact checking media, and not promote garbage. The media bears responsibility. I, I think uh, th th there's been a, 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 a fundamental change in the way media is in that uh, the, the old reporting with, with newspapers and magazines and all, a lot of that's disappearing. It's, it's shifted over to the internet now, which isn't so regulated as newspapers and magazines once were. They had editors to filter uh, information that was coming out through their outlets. And with the internet, uh, there's no filter really. Um, and, and that is a great don't follow the rules and, and others don't follow any rules and and they and you compare websites of one to the other and they they both look equally good if they're they're constructed well and people don't know how to weigh and assess which one is correct and which one isn't and it, that's got to change you know that's got to we we need to 
make take the responsibility ourselves as adults to actually learn how this works and how to fact check and how to understand that when you've got you know a media outlet or an entertainment media outlet whatever you want to call it you know again like do your homework look at who owns the media outlet mm. look at their mm. motivations you can do there are websites where you can go to to check the bias of a particular organization and uh, I, I think these are important things for all of us to do. And as you mentioned, you know, you've got the internet with all of these really slick looking websites that are popping up, UAP caucus, um, where you can go and get bits of information and, you know, it looks really fabulous. And, oh, here we go. Enter all your personal data right here. We're going to help you, you know, flood the lines of everybody in Congress to talk about UAP legislation you know, right when there are huge conflicts going on all over the world, that might not be maybe somebody's ploy uh, to gum up the system, but it's like we have that, you know, we have the responsibility to do that. We have a responsibility, The you know, our elected officials have a responsibility as well to make sure that we are getting good information and to make mm -hmm. sure that they're not a part of the problem, you know, that we yeah. see uh, in full display here in Utah with some of our political leaders. But yeah. It's just I, I, I'm, I'm looking at chat here and, and Drew Williamson brought up a, a point that uh, we were talking about a while back. He says, uh, obviously, no one contacted Barry or Jan, Jan Aldrich, uh, before preparing the report. Uh, yeah, it, it's not that they have to contact me or particular people. But contact sources, especially government. They, they were told who's out there, who has a lot of credible information, who's worked on the subject for a very long time. Um, there's a few folks close to Washington who have, have dropped that uh, to, to congressmen and senators and all about uh, where they should call when, when something comes into question about uh, facts and information. It, it seemed to me that whenever uh, a government inquiry is announced that the uh, the first people in line from outside are the grifters and uh, um, people of, of dubious background that want to take advantage of, of the publicity and, and possible uh, funding. Uh, and they, they shove and get in the front of the line and, and put themselves out there as, as the prime sources of information. And... Uh, you look at, at uh, who's advising uh, the witnesses uh, that were at the congressional hearings last year. Jeremy Corbell was at, it was prominently featured. He was placed right in the back of all the witnesses. And I'm saying to myself, wait a minute, don't you want someone with, with a, a skilled in, in perhaps government UFO data or, or military incident sightings when they've investigated for a long time and, and they know the subject very well. They can correct things on the fly because they remember those things happening. But but it seemed like they, they took uh, relatively inexperienced folks and, and plopped them right in front of the, the cameras for being authorities and Oh, you, Jeremy Corbell's not an authority? Uh, well, I mean, he, any number of times he's gone public, he's been shot down very quickly by what he was claiming was good information. Uh, the so-called uh, the, the, the Pacific videos, the, the triangular objects seen on video that uh, were clearly, clearly artifacts of the uh, camera rather than you know, real object shaped like that and a matter of fact i understand they're still doubling down on those being genuine why doesn't because the media is still playing clips those clips well, well what, what's what's peculiar is you, you look at the videos you look at them up close and it, there's object there's an object moving and then in the background you see other lights which are obviously stars taken at night night vision if you enlarge the video those uh, those background lights, which are the stars, they're shaped the same way as the object. So they, they've taken on the, the aspect of the UFO that's being photographed, meaning it, it's not that stars are shaped like that. It's that the camera is, is a bit out of focus, and it's showing what the shape of the iris is in the night vision. So 
it, it's easily seen and easily explained. But they continue to say it's genuine. Because they know they can get away with it. I mean, how easy is that for them? Like, look at the TTSA when they had their big launch. We, yeah. You've got, you know, Balloon Boy there uh, promoting, it, you know, standing in front of you know, there are people. balloons. It's like, freaking, they, and they know it. They know it. There are people you know out there stupid. that could give perspective on these incidents, but they're not consulted at all. And there's no good reason why they aren't. They're given the names, they're given the contact information. They just choose not to. Right. Well, they, 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 the one pushed in the front of the line is the one we'll listen to. And everybody else is just, we don't have time for that. And the one then, with the coolest bro beard. What kind of investigation is that? It's not a good investigation. You're not considering all sources. And they have the money to do it. But that's the whole point. They don't care because they know they yeah. can get away with a, making up dino beavers and, you know, the smoking well, yeah. dog men and, and all of that. And that people are going to listen and that they'll, you know, I mean, actually, it is just, it's insane to me. But um, if, if, if you've been involved in research and that topic for a long time and you, you finally get to the point where you have someone listening to you in government that'll uh, give a hearing to the, the, all of the events and information that you've come across over that time, and instead they ignore you and and go to some flyby nighter. <laughs> it makes you want to just say, "Well, why am I involved in this? Why should I bother? I, I, I should get out and do something else, like collect bottle caps or something." Well, if anybody would have a really cool bottle cap collection, it would be you, Barry. Because you're very meticulous with everything that you. It, it would be it would be nice and polished and perfect. Exactly. Believe me. In perfect order, I know. But I think you know that's the thing with all of this that everybody needs to understand. This was never about UFOs. This was mm -hmm. about creating discourse. This was about you know seeping into our government and. Well, yeah. You, you it, know, it, talk it, about it, we want to talk about the hitchhiker effect. There you okay. go. That's what uh, the hitchhiker yeah. effect is. It's the this. You know, it, in a broader sense, it's about the one word, power. It's power. It's who tells what to who at any given time. Power gets money. Power gets influence. It's power. It's, it's, it's having the bully pulpit. You get up front and speak loudly and longly, and people listen to you. And when you when you do that with bad information, uh, it used to be called the big lie, something Hitler exploited. You just tell you bad things many times and very loud, you know, with the fists in the air. People listen and they think it's real because, well, he's so emphatic about it. There's got to be something to it. And that's what ufologists do. Many of them. Yes, yes, it's they made do. a mess of everything. That and take videos of their butt climbing up a mountain because that's always my one of my favorites. Yeah, well, yeah, we were talking about uh, Peter Gersten today and and his uh, the final time he was in the news where he claimed that uh, you know, it, it, he started out as a great lawyer, you know, suing government for UFO documents, and we got a lot of things released, but he kind of tailed off and got into some more uh, peculiar topics. And and uh, I recall some years back, he uh, claimed he was going to jump into a vortex from a, a cliff. Not my near, first choice. Near Sedona. And uh, he kept repeating that and all. And and I, I recall uh, the, one of the night uh, talk shows, uh, Chelsea Handler uh, ridiculed him for it. And his intent was to go up and jump and into the vortex and go into another realm. And was he going to just uh, take a parachute in case? Well, yeah, a, no parachute. I guess okay. it was just going to be. He did such confidence in doing it, he was going to do that. So uh, as the time drew near, I, apparently the police showed up and they weren't going to allow him to do any jumping off anything. So um, he stayed away. But that that was he was the former head of of cause in its original iteration between uh, well 1978 and 1982 or so 
I, I stepped in later and, and uh, you know, myself and Larry Fawcett, we decided to run it because nobody was running it anymore. It, it had fallen into a uh, uh, portal. So, you know, we revived it and we tried to apply the, the critical thinking into it. And uh, we went on for 14 years. And then uh, around 1998, Peter wanted it back. And he, he did it in an underhanded way, to me anyway. He, uh, he said he was going to use, he wanted permission to use the cause name to file FOIA requests. And I said, yeah, you don't have to ask permission. I mean, you started the organization, so, you know, file FOIAs. And, but instead, it wasn't to file FOIAs. He was using it to reconstruct cause with the people he chose. And I looked around and said, where are these people coming from? And uh, I said, and there were people that were fundamentally different in thinking about the topic uh, uh, than me. So I said, look, I, you know, is this what you're doing? I'm, I'm going to leave. And I ended it right then and there. I didn't, uh, I didn't stay with the organization at all. It was, it was terrible because uh, if you go out and, and look at a Wikipedia entry, on cause, Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, uh, you'll notice that uh, before uh, uh, Larry and I were there and after Larry and I were there, it's it's in uh, the, the entry. There's nothing in between. There's no mention of us at all. For, that was the longest period of cause, 14 years. Well, but as we know, it, Wikipedia it, it, can it, be we, manipulated we, by skeptics. We, well, we were ghosted. Out of out of that history, mm. which, which astonished me because how could you? I mean, it depends on who's writing the history, obviously. But it, it's it, if that's what Wikipedia represents, then it's not objective at all. Whoever can wants to write a slant on it, they're going to do it, and it stays in there. Even if you want to correct it, sometimes you kind of get it out. But that's the way they, they constructed the history of uh, Citizens Against UFO Secrecy. They just wrote I mean, us out of there. And But have you tried to get that edit, edit on that? Yeah, we tried. It, it was rebuffed. I don't know why. Because they could prove everything about what, those 14 years. But I, I think it was mainly because we weren't um, advocates enough. You know, at that point, we were we were going after MJ-12. We made critical comments about citing reports at times that happened in the news. And we criticized government as well. We criticized the other side. But it was it, we tried to be even-handed about it. But I guess that's the wrong thing to do. And, and so did what happened when Peter had his, you know, breakdown? I mean, so the police were called. He, did he exit? He obviously... It, it, it just dropped out of sight. I, I, he went on, I, as far as I know, uh, he he lived in Sedona and he opened a business of giving tours of the area's uh, landscapes and all. Having tourists come in and pay him to take them around and show the sites. So that's what he did. That seems to me to be a big come down from a lawyer. Yeah, that's unfortunate that he had... You know, such a but maybe but that's uh, that's the last I heard about him. He mm -hmm. didn't get involved in UFO matters anymore from that point. I think he was involved in advising uh, uh, Native Americans on legal matters as well. Well, that's that's I'm but, but, but the, the, the UFO thing, the UFO thing with him died. I mean, I don't know, early 2000s. After he took cause, he created a website, and it was full of junk and nonsense and a lot of appeals for money. Uh, but he, uh, it, it just wasn't interesting enough uh, for people, so they just dropped out of sight on him, and he dropped out of sight on everyone else. It is unfortunate how, especially because you've known a lot of people over the decades, and you can look back and see the way the subjects can really attract people that have issues to begin with, which is, you know, there needs to be a safe, safe space. There, this needs to be understood and, and 
um, supported a little bit more than it has been uh, taken seriously. But, you know, you've seen people who have come into this with with good intentions and, you know, for the love of, of looking for, you know, mystery and, and for mysterious things. I mean, this is a, is a great, it should be a very empowering subject. But as you know, over the, the decades, it takes its toll mm, on people yeah. and it can be a very disappointing yeah. subject at the end of the day when people have spent their whole lives, you know, looking yeah, for it, answers. The, the, and the, the relentless uh, march of information coming at you all the time. There's one controversy after another. There's piles of stories and reports, thousands of cases to study and analyze and figure out that I, I think it just, uh, I don't know, it, it, uh, it forces people that went into it with honest intentions to try to force getting a resolution because resolution isn't going to come from the information itself. It's just not enough of it to point in a particular direction on some of the stories. So they, they'll take that void and, and try to force feed something into it, uh, a personal belief of some kind. Right. And then that becomes the fact to them. And over time, it, it just gets more and more embellished. They add detail to it that's even more bizarre. And you know, the more bizarre, the better with some, uh, if they want it that way. I, you know, it's, it's dishonest, but they've convinced themselves that's what they want to do. And who, like, I mean, and I don't know if you feel comfortable naming names, but who have you been, you know, give us an example of somebody that you had, like, high hopes for and saw a really promising, uh, grounded approach to that you saw later in their life and, you know, gone kind of uh, off. Well, yeah, I mean, the name names, it, that's, it, it, it's difficult. I mean, this is public figures that have gone in that direction. Uh, uh, you know, I, I at, at first I thought Stan Friedman was a pretty good, promoter of the subject. He, he tried to be serious about it. He wasn't over the bo over the top with his claims. This would be in the 70s. And, uh, you know, the cosmic Watergate and all that. That was a lot of fun. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it was just kind of mainstream ufology. It was not, not that spectacular. Uh, he gave rousing lectures. He was good at public speaking and all. And, you know, it was fun. Uh, but then... Uh, he he discovered Roswell, and he he took Jesse Marcel's story and searched around to see if other people uh, were involved in it. And he he got a varying degree of, of people that claimed to be witnesses uh, to the events at Roswell at that time, and he he pretty much took. Uh, the, the, the information is pretty solid. Uh, it's not necessarily it was documented, but the, the stories were pretty vivid. And he enjoyed that. He liked that. And and he had his own version of Roswell. If you look around, there's, there's multiple versions of the Roswell incident out there. His was just one of them. And others had their own versions of it. I, one or two crash sites, six crash sites. They were located all over the state of New Mexico. There's just no keeping track of how many versions uh, there were of Roswell. But um, then with his version, his partner uh, at, at the time, Bill Moore, uh, was, was loitering around with Richard Doty, <laughs> who's an infamous character in the subject. And... Uh, they, they were cooking up a, a, a way to uh, make a buck. They, they wrote a fiction novel called on, called The Aquarius Project. And Doty was the hero of the novel. And, uh, you know, discovering the cosmic cover-up and the aliens in space and all. It was just, uh, you know, a fictional tale. But uh, they, they had a uh, former National Enquirer writer, Bob Pratt, uh, do the polish on it. So there were three authors, and the manuscript was there. And at some point, uh, the, uh, Moore and, and Doty decided to change the direction of the fiction and turn it into fact. And and uh, Bob Pratt, at 
just dropped out of it at, like that. He, he just didn't think it was a good idea to, to hey, don't uh, take this fictional story and, and make it real. And he didn't want to be part of it. So Moore and Doty went off into MJ-12. And they told a version of, of MJ-12 that was favorable to Stan Friedman's version of Roswell. So when they tell Stan that they have the secret information and they recount what they claim to have been told, Stan buys it because it's it goes right in with what Stan believed. And he jumped on the project. And they promoted the thing through the 80s uh, until 1987. They, they released what they claim were documents that proved it was genuine and... Um, I mean, from my own point of view, once I saw the documents, I, I said, BS. Well, I can say bullshit on this because it's a podcast. <laughs> uh, but that's what happened. It just, I, I saw a rat. It's, it, it, it just didn't look right. And uh, at that, from that point on, Stan continued uh, in spite of really stark information that there was a problem with it, he continued to promote it and it, it reminded me of uh, someone like the captain of the titanic the ship was hopeless but he was just going to go down with the ship and he can he, he uh stuck by every bit of it as if it were genuine and there wasn't any problem with the story although he was quick to criticize a second version of mj12 that came out in, in the mid 90s by tim cooper Cooper had his own collection of documents on MJ-12, but Stan jumped all over him on it. Oh, those are no good, but mine are good. And they, they both came from fictional sources or unaccountable sources. So I, I think Stan was an example of what you're talking about, that he was good. And then it, it just getting himself connected to MJ-12, he just kind of trailed off uh, and... Uh, lost credibility because of it well and he also and you've mentioned this on other shows that you've been on i mean there were also you know he was um went to great lengths to try to to uh, uh for lack of a better word bully or intimidate other researchers yeah the there were times yeah Randall's there were times uh, he did he did become heavy-handed he he made a legal threat at me uh, the, the basis of which baffled me, but he, he wanted to do something legally. He wanted, he threatened uh, Robert Todd, a, a friend of mine that worked on government documents because he didn't believe MJ-12. Bill Moore threatened another person I knew who wrote about uh, uh, the, the, the problems with MJ-12. They, they, were, they were quick to make legal threats that had nothing to do with the information uh, itself. It was just a, a way to intimidate, try to make you uh, say, well, no, I don't, I don't want to be sued. So I'm just going to back off and let you guys uh, say what you want. Uh, of course, we didn't do that. You know, we had rights too. We had rights to criticize it's free speech. Uh, if it's a, a story for which you have poor sourcing, uh, you have every right to criticize it. And uh, now no amount of bullying is going to change that. There were, there were also uh, discovery proceedings you could enact uh, against them. They'd have right. to produce all their paperwork yep. if they were going to go after you. And exactly. they didn't want it. That's the last thing they wanted to do. <laughs> right. Well, that's exactly why I'm, because I, you that, know, if somebody been, comes at me, guess what? Discovery is a yeah, yeah. good process. The discovery, so. discovery would have discovered the, the fiction novel that they wrote right which was prior to any of the real allegedly real stuff coming out and that was it's still devastating that that exists most people don't know it exists but that was the the outline of mj12 prior to all the publicity and that would have come out in court would have crashed the story earlier than they wanted to Yes, sometimes people don't understand that when you, you know, make those legal threats, that that's that there are people smart enough to understand what really happens yeah. in that 
regard. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it, it's not like one person has all the rights and the other guy has no rights. Right. <laughs> it, it's, you know, you, you have recourse uh, for something like that. If, if there's recourse to be had, but the, you know, the, their, their initial claims were so full of holes and, and lacked such a solid base that there really was no basis uh, for them having a strong case ag about anything. It, it was just intimidation, a way to keep you from going further. Shut up. Shut your mouth. Don't yep. don't talk about this anymore or else. Well, it's good to know that the bullying narrative is not as, you know, quadrupled in <laughs> what's going on. And now we just have people that are doxing other people and doing all sorts of fun stuff and whatever is it's just yeah there's, there's other techniques people can use without having to resort to expensive uh court cases right and so i wanted to ask you because there's so many things to talk about my vancouver guy is, is making some great all of you guys are making great points i love our conversations to see all of you in chat because this is really not only a respectful uh dialogue but you bring up all of you bring up some really great points and i apologize if i don't get to all of them, but I am paying attention. But Vancouver guy mentioned that some people were surprised that MJ12 wasn't uh, really reported in the era report. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, MJ12 was, I mean, this pro professed to be a study of official projects and MJ12 was never an official project. There was nothing to talk about except for it being a hoax. And, you know, they might have uh, mentioned that there was a hoax to that effect in the report, but I guess they felt it wasn't necessary to bring it up. So, you know, it, 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 it was a little off target for what they were trying to do. Okay. And it is my birthday. Thank you, Phil. I've got to just say thank you. And thank you for the birthday wishes. I had, you know, over 200 wonderful birthday wishes um, on Facebook and uh, like I said, I can't think of a better way to spend my birthday than hanging out with all of you guys and talking to my friend Barry and celebrating our victory at Expanding Frontiers with regard to um, the Phenomicon conference and records being withholded that are no longer withheld, which is great. Mm -hmm. So that's a wonderful thing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, thanks you guys, um, a little bit about the new, uh, what's happening with MUFON right now and their, their latest announcement. Um, okay. What's their latest announcement? So with the, they've got a new... <laughs> I'm not a, I, you well, know no, what? They... I, I haven't been a member since uh, 1987. So they have a new person that's involved with MUFON that is a lobbyist? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that I did hear. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess they paid uh, a ton of money to a lobbying firm uh to speak on their behalf to government and uh the figure i heard was eighty thousand uh, dollars which coincidentally was very much uh, the same figure i heard when um way back in the 90s uh, uh, uh joe firmage who's another dicey character uh that paid uh for ad space in USA Today, full page, by the way, um, uh, to promote his uh, theories about UFOs and, and something he called the truth. He had a book by that title. There's a, there's, there's a full version and an abbreviated version. We can't find the full one anywhere, but there's an abbreviated one that's still available, I think, online, if you uh, can track it down. But the, the, the point of it is that Sums of money like that, that were available to promote really iffy things and, and uh, like like lobbying to, to do publicity for an organization. Yeah, that's expensive in the corporate world and all, but ufology was never known as an expensive place. Never had enough money to, to do things and to spend it uh, on lobbying or on on uh, political matters instead of using it for research is to me uh, reprehensible. Well, and Flamingo Air is also a client. Let's just be 
very bold about that one as well. <laughs> yeah, it's just large sums going for, for very focused topics that really didn't do much of anything to help uh, resolve these puzzles or improve that uh, very much, improve investigative techniques or education on how to uh, think think about these things. Instead, it's going to political people to try to bull rush uh, the pro-ET influence through uh, uh, political structure. And the ultimate goal of that is, of course, funding. You can spend $80,000 to get a lobbyist and convince Congress to, to fund ufology, then a lot of that money and a lot more is going to come back to you if you can succeed. It, it, the thing is, it almost never succeeds. And MUFON's had this in mind for years. I, I remember back in the 80s when uh, they appointed a fellow from Connecticut named Robert Bletchman. He was a lawyer and he was a friend of Larry Fawcett's. They, they appointed him uh, public relations director. And the first thing he went out and did was to convince Walt Andrus to spend tens of thousands of dollars on a lobbyist, a, a public relations firm. And uh, they came up with a prospectus, a fairly small document in the folder, and, and it told how MUFON can uh, uh, promote themselves. And it would have cost too much money for MUFON to put that into effect, so they gave up on the idea. But it flushed something like $30,000 uh, to pay that firm uh, uh, to come up with that. And it, it, you know, at the time, I said, geez, I mean, they have money to waste like that, and, they, and they, they can't put it into good research. Now, MUFON does have a lot of money. Uh, in, in the in the uh, around 2008 or 9 all they, they became connected to uh, uh, Bacardi Eris uh, Bigelow yeah that too and big money and, and government money and uh, the, the increase the the income increased dramatically you, you can get the tax forms you know if you go to the right place you can download them and take a look at them and there's some remarkable money there you know, and it is very interesting, too, because you can also go to, you know, it's important to go to other, uh, you know, like the Orange County MUFON. And, yeah. you know, cause they yeah. have a lot of money going through that as, as well. It's not just, mm. you know, the MUFON headquarters. So it is it is interesting what what is money being spent on. It's clearly, um, I think that there are a lot of potentials for, in, <laughs> I'm going to be quiet now. Sometimes I just say too much, but I'm sure everybody can understand what I'm not saying. Well, Lots we, of interesting we, games with money going on. In we, the we'd always, you know, in the past, we'd scrounge for, for pennies and dollars trying to fund FOIA requests and, and get what we thought was real information out. And, and it was always a struggle. We never had much in the way of a, a money pot to draw from to, to push these, these interests along, but now there's piles of it. And, uh, you know, the, the, the potential now is there that you can invest a large amount of money and, and have a reasonable expectation that you'll get uh, a lot of it back in terms of, uh, you know, influence in Washington. It, it's, there's some there already. And there's some organizations out there that, that seem to be well-funded that we know almost little or nothing about. Exactly. I mean, are, what what organizations are you referring to? Uh, it, well, Enigma, uh, uh, Saul, some other. I, it just, uh, it, it, it seems like there's groups that have come out with, with a, a pretty good bank account to spend on whatever they're doing. Uh, with Enigma, it's cataloging cases and and probably data mining, but we don't know what they're data mining. What do right. they have? What are they drawing from? What what kind of information are they using? Is it on the public record or is it a secret stash of other UFO files that we know nothing about? It, it, the transparency is not there. Isn't it funny that people are are screaming and 
and moaning about UAP transparency and when the, there's a clear lack of transparency right in front of their faces, nobody's saying a word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hello, uh, Kelly. Well, that's one of the things that uh, in my complaint about the, the Arrow report, uh, sourcing, where does information come from? The, the report complained about ufologists providing unnamed sources as background for the, the, the claims that they had to look into to see if they were credible or not. But then Arrow turns around and, and keeps all of their sightings secret that they analyzed. They don't make them available in any way for, for fact checking or, or uh, uh, doing as you do in science, taking a claim and then having independent sources look at it to see if they come to the same conclusions. But isn't there, aren't there national security implications to this? They claim, yeah. I mean, so, it, I mean it, there are some. There are some, but not always. Uh, and so I just want to go back because I was, you know, back in chat a little bit earlier, they were talking about the drone footage um, mm. and at the border and people, you know, with drug, drug transactions going on and different things and people are, claiming that, you know, these are UAP or what, and, and, and so, good Lord, there is, there are some security implications there. Yeah, I mean, there are some. Good Lord. But uh, we looked, when the original task force report came out, they, uh, they, they looked at data that we used to look at in sighting reports, the shapes of objects, the sizes of them, you know, the basic things you would see on a sighting report form. And... They, they gave the statistics, but didn't they wouldn't allow anyone to see shapes that were being reported, even if the shapes were just circles. Object was circular in the sky. They couldn't release any any kind of specific information about what it looked like. Even as even as a circle, it, it was suppressed. I won't say suppress, I should say just kept out of scrutiny. So you, it, it just went back to the thing about accept my conclusions and assume that there's national security involved with it. But when you look at the data, there's not always national security involved with it. It's just keeping you know, the shapes and sizes and colors uh, away from anyone to, to see it all. That That was what I meant about, you know, just not making valid information available. They, they weren't transparent about things that they should have been or could have been. Yes. And I, again, I go back to the fact that there are, I, I don't like, for me, I don't understand like how people do not take national security concerns seriously. Like we are mm -hmm. expected to, I mean, Hey, let's go hang out on the border of area 51 and let's make sure we photograph everything that we're seeing in a top secret military installation and then put that mm -hmm. all over, you know, the internet. I mean, it's just like how seriously people like, we, yeah. I mean, don't we, especially right now, shouldn't it, it, we yeah. care about. It, it's, it's ironic because it, uh, through most of the history of the topic, all you heard from government was there's no national security threat even though we knew there was, you know, based upon sightings over military bases and all that, that's an automatic national security issue. But in spite and of those UFO reports- the narrative was a good cover up for uh, yeah. incursion by a foreign adversary. You know? Well, I wrote about it. I mean, I had a book in, uh, some years ago about uh, military incidents uh, that, that violated national security. And I wrote that up in clear intent at the same time they were saying there is no national security threat same time so which was it as it turned out there was a national security threat with some of the reports there but maybe they knew it was actually a, a foreign adversary well in the case of the 75 overflights i don't know what those were exactly uh you know they, they might have been legitimate explanations for some of them but that they, they weren't even in the mood to do a final report wrapping all that up. There should have been. There should have been something saying, look, you know, we had these incidents over three, four weeks or so of military bases being uh, overflown by something, lights, formations, uh, uh, oval-shaped objects, uh, 
just just uh, an inundation of of uh, these things, and uh, we we sat down and looked at it all, and and we think this is what happened at this and that and the other base. They never did that. There was never a wrap up report on the seventy five overflights at all. They just let it go. And guys came out since saying, you know, to them, uh, some of it was far stranger than what was implied in the documents themselves. But, you know, enough time has gone by that you, you can't prove that anymore. They couldn't talk at the time because they were in the service and they retire and get out and say, look, you know, here's what really happened. But. You know, we can't prove it anymore. We don't have access to the paperwork now. Some of the paperwork got out. And I, I'd really be curious if someone filed FOIA requests on the 75 overflights, how much of what we found then would come out now? I, I guarantee you there'd be a much smaller percentage. Some of those documents have vanished. Interesting. At one, at one point in the past, I, I remember that uh, there was an effort to reclassify uh, some of those documents. So we already had them, but but uh, uh, the military wanted to reclassify them so you couldn't talk about them anymore, even if you had copies of them. That's but do you think that's because it had anything to do with UFOs, truly? Yeah. I mean, extraterrestrial technology? Uh, no, they didn't say that. They just say, you know, we, we want to reclassify them. But I mean, don't you think, like when when you know, when you say that, I think some people that are, well, they they would yeah. use that to, infer, to think yeah. that it was they're hiding ET. Right, they they'd infer a conspiracy. It, it, often the often government was its own worst enemy in creating conspiracy theories because they would do things sometimes uh, clumsily, where they would uh, uh, give statements on in an explanation or something. It was so ludicrous that you couldn't possibly believe it. There was one series of events in the summer of 65 uh, in the Midwest where they dismissed all the reports as uh, the, the belt stars of Orion being seen. It, it's a nice straight line of three stars, but uh, it, it became quickly apparent through investigative journalism that they checked and found that, that the belt stars of Orion weren't even above the horizon at the time of the sightings. So when, when you see that, you, you say, oh, what are you covering up now? You, you get that totally messed up. What's going on here? They created that notion of conspiracy by fouling up the explanation. It's very interesting. Yeah, so. the whole thing is very, very, very interesting. And of course, this has been, I, I could, as you know, you and I talk for hours and hours and hours and and I always have such great, you know, we have great conversations. I've learned so much from you over the years. It's been really fun um, and, and empowering. And I just, it's, I love it. And thanks, Phil. Good night. I hope you have a great night. Thanks for your, your comments in chat. Um, so, yeah, it's, the whole thing is very interesting. It's going to be, like I mentioned, the next few months are going to be a rocky road. And so I just want to make sure everybody is prepared and, and do yourself a, a favor and learn about disinformation campaigns and, and um, all of these things. Uh, learn about what are, we're being told by people that would know about the ways so, social media is manipulated um, to create discontent and to, to you know, uh, light the pitchforks or light the fire and get, you know, like we see the weaponization of, of this subject by people like Jeremy Corbell and his, his group. But I think it is important. So make sure you guys really do your due diligence. And as Barry and I've mentioned in the show before, just because a new website is showing up and it looks bright and put together and it's, it's, you know, wonderful and they're giving some information, but at the end of the day, if you don't know who's behind that website, then, you know, I would run not walk, but I would really run quite quickly, and I sure wouldn't be putting my personal information on that website. Yeah, it's, it's internet wolf in sheep's clothing. Right. And I do think it is a little bit, you know, it is, is, it is sad because there are older people in, in the subject that don't have that awareness of what's going on in, you know, today, currently. And so 
we all, I think, have a job to protect the people that we love and the friends, our friends and things from, from different scams. Um, so those are my thoughts, but I just, this has been a fascinating conversation and there were a million questions that I could have asked you, but I didn't get to. So that means you'll come back again and again and again and again and again. Till I get too old to hold my head up. Well, um, I'd have to go back and edit the show since I divulged my top secret information at the beginning of the show. I'm, I'm, I'm still amazed. I, that, that, that was the revelation of the year to me. <laughs> oh, never going to live it down. But, but I, never, I never told you my age, did I? Well, tell the world now. Maybe I won't. Oh, rude. <laughs> I should have done that. Dang it. Oh, well. Cat's out of the bag. <laughs> uh, people can see it in my biography anyway. I'm 71. That's all. That's young. You look great. Uh, whiter, but that doesn't make any difference. Well, I'm glad that you're healthy, and and I'm glad that both of us are healthy. I'm, you know, knocking on wood, and and so I, thank you for everything. You, you don't thank have you a gray hair everything. on your head. Uh, well, I'd like to say it's genetics or L'Oreal number 95. No. Yeah. You know, good hairdresser. You know, well, what's this conspiracy? <laughs> I don't know, but perhaps it's all my, you know, YouTube um, beauty. It's That's what I do. I get on YouTube and look at all the beauty videos. And then, you know, I'm putting Preparation H under my bags, under my eyes. You know, Lord knows what happens. <laughs> Is that really Never mind. Pardon? Does that really work? Uh, you know, it 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 does. It doesn't smell very good, but you know, I mean, it was especially an old trick. I, I, especially I you have to use it the right way a few times. Yes. Well. Anyway, on that note, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thanks for being a part of EFR, and I want to just really quickly before we go, I just have to give a little shout out again to Mr. Brewer. And I didn't show, and I'm so sorry, Barry, do it really quickly, guys, so hang, bear with me. So I wanna show Jack at work, right there, Thursday, State Records Committee hearing. Oh. Jack was on top of it. He was excellent, uh, provided nothing but the facts. Um, again, I'm so proud to be a part of Expanding Frontiers and, and please um, you know, sign up and, and donate to our organization because we are doing great work and it is important. And I also want to just show really quickly, we didn't even talk about this, but what you're doing right now. Yeah, I, I mean, just briefly, it's a, a project I started quite a long time ago, actually, where in the effort to preserve documentation on UFO phenomenon and all that, I handle all kinds of different uh, uh, types of presentations on the topic. And back in the 60s, there was a series in the newspapers called Our Space Age by Otto Binder, who had happened to write a UFO book in 1974. But he uh, he, he was interested in, in uh, documenting the space age. And he had an artist, uh, and they got together in a syndicate. And uh, daily, there would be different renditions of the space age. And then as they, they ran out of uh, issues to talk about, they shifted over to UFOs around 1965. And there was a whole series of panels of these things, uh, all different sightings, uh, sightings that people wrote into them about that were uniquely in those panels and nowhere else. And that went on for about 10 years, uh, over 2,800 panels. I took it upon myself to uh, try to find all those panels. And just a few weeks ago, I found the last one. Congratulations. After, after 25 years. That's exciting. So now I'm just trying to organize them and get them all presentable. Yeah, absolutely. That's exciting, Barry. And you'll definitely keep, we'll keep, you know, keep, obviously you'll be on the show. I just mentioned that again and again. So anyway, thank you. Thank you for your good work that you have done. You really are the, I mean, you're a one-man machine who has really done more to preserve the history of the subject than any any person or organization that I know. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. So thank yeah. you. For there's, there's others out there. Yeah, some, there are. But some of them aren't named, but they're out there. 
Yes, some of them aren't named, um, but they're, I, you are, and you. I know the work that you've put into this, and thank you. We're overall very appreciative of that, so thank you. And I want to just thank everybody for being here, your great comments. Thanks for the birthday wishes. Thanks for supporting Expanding Frontiers. And Weird Reads uh, with Emily Louise, tomorrow night you can check it out. She's doing her show live on Saturdays. I, I was fortunate enough that I could watch it last Saturday and I loved the conversation about Armin Victorian and Richard Doty and all of the cast of characters. It's such a great show and I'm so supportive and and really excited to know people like Emily who is, is out there kicking butt and taking names and we're, like I said, we have a community. We've created a wonderful, wonderful community. We're gonna keep doing that because we're all promoting truth and, um, and good work. So thank you guys. Thanks Barry. You guys You're have bad. a wonderful evening. I'm going to quit talking now, but look at the numbers for the show's the show tonight. I'm really stoked. What a great birthday present! So mm. thanks, you guys. I'll chat with you later, Barry. See you. Thanks, Mario. Thanks, Peter. Good night, you guys. <laughs>